Today, I want to go ahead and talk about how to live this Christian walk in a community in which Jesus says is filled with wolves. It's filled with wolves. How are we going to live out the Christian walk with God in a community in the world that is filled with wolves? And so to do this, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is hit his ministry. He's in, he's in full throttle when it comes to his ministry in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus, he's going around, he's healing the sick, he's doing all the stuff that he said he would do uh, at the prior, uh, after his baptisms, he is out doing the work. And so you get to Matthew chapter 9, and you see that he's doing the work. Go with me to verse 35. By the way, today will be a dense message. I hope that you brought your notes, um, a, a pen to write notes, because I'm just going to, I'm going to plaster you with the word of God this morning. Can we do that? Can we do that? Yeah. Here we go. Look at me at verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness, healing every disease and sickness, healing every disease and sickness. Does it say he was praying for every healing, uh, praying for every disease and sickness, or healing every disease and sickness? He was what? So Jesus wasn't going around laying hands on people praying for them, was he? Was he? He was actually going, laying hands on people, and healing them. And sicknesses and diseases were being cured among the people. And so he's, he's among the people. He's going from town to town to town. He's preaching the gospel. He's healing sickness. He's healing diseases. Okay, and he sees the multitudes of people. And he says, these people look like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, and then he says, notice this, go to verse 37. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray, everybody say pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. So Jesus is walking around with his 12 amigos, and he's healing the sick, he's preaching the gospel, and they're just watching him do all the stuff. He gives his disciples only one assignment. He says, I want you to pray. And what does he ask for pray? What does he tell us to pray for? He says, I want you to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers out into the harvest because the harvest is ripe, but the laborers, the laborers are so few. He says, therefore, I want you to what? I want you to? So in other words, God is saying this, I want you to pray for the lost people. I want you to pray that the reach of God in this place will go far and wide all over the world. I want you to pray, 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 because it's just me doing all the work, says Jesus. It's me doing all the work. You're the 12 disciples. You've been following me. I haven't given you any of the work to do yet other than just follow me. Watch and observe. Learn. That's what it means to be a disciple. Be a learner. Watch my way. See what I'm doing. So Jesus is healing, and they're just like, wow, wow. Okay, we finally get an assignment. What's our assignment? Pray. And what are we praying for? We're praying for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the harvest because the laborers are few. And so Jesus says, I want you to pray for God to save lost people all over the world. I want you to pray, 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 pray. In other words, I want you to pray that Orange Veil would be saturated with people who want to share the gospel, with people who are laboring for seeing souls come into the kingdom of God. A revival spirit God is wanting to release in the Orange Veil, Roseville, the whole community of Granite Bay, Fair Oaks. I want you to pray that the Lord would send laborers out. I want you to really pray for souls to get saved. When's the last time you really prayed for souls to get saved? We probably don't pray for souls to get saved. 
We probably don't because we're so consumed with praying for our own soul to experience salvation in certain ways. And we're always praying for our own health. We're always praying for our own finances. Is, did Jesus say, I want you to pray for your finances here? Did he say, I want you to pray for your own health here? Did he say, I want you to pray for your family here? Or did he say, I want you to pray for the lost? I want you to pray for the laborers. So this is their number one assignment. I want you to pray for the... Because Jesus knows if he can get you praying for something, you'll be bent leaning into that something to do something about it. If you're praying for your health all the time, what's going to be on your mind all the time? If you're praying for your family all the time, what's going to be in your heart all the time? You're going to want things to get better with your family. You're going to want things to get better for your health. If you're praying for the lost, where do you think your heart's going to start leaning towards? So Jesus, he's a sly cat, isn't he? He says, hey, before you go out and do anything, I want you to pray about it first. Take it up with me. How many of you guys know God's own, his main heart for planet Earth is that everyone would hear the gospel, turn from their sin, and know him. That is his number one concern. His number one concern. So Jesus lays out this command. He says, I want you to go out, and I, I want, no, I don't want you to go out. I just want you to pray. I want you to pray for souls to get saved. That's it. And because the laborers are so few, now Jesus, he switches it. He does a 180 on them. Look at this. Notice verse 1 in chapter 10. When he called his 12 disciples to him, he now gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and diseases. Okay, okay, look at the shift here. Jesus says, I want you to pray for those to get saved. And now he shifts it and he says, now that you're praying for people to get saved, I'm going to go ahead and give you my authority. I'm going to give you authority over all sicknesses, over all diseases. I'm going to give you the authority to preach the kingdom of God and make it impact because you've been praying for it, but now I actually want you to start doing it because the laborers are few. You got to watch out what you pray for because God will hold you accountable to obeying him in whatever category that you're praying for. If you're praying to be a better husband, he's going to hold you, start holding you accountable to be a better what? If, you, if, if you're praying to be a better spouse, a better wife, then God's going to hold you accountable to be becoming a better wife. But he doesn't just let you do it on your own. He gives you his authority, his backing behind it. And so in chapter 10, 1 through 15, it's all about Jesus commissioning his disciples, giving them something that's within himself. He's giving them spiritual authority over diseases, over sickness, over demons, and to proclaim the kingdom of God because Jesus is not going to waste his mission on earth. And guess what, church? We're not going to waste our mission here at Thrive Church. Our mission is to save that which is lost and bring them into the kingdom of God because in the end, everyone's going to stand before him and give an account, and we want to make sure we've done our job. That way they can get a good report card. Amen? Amen. So here we go. So chapter 10, verse 1 through 15, Jesus is giving them authority. Authority. And we even see it again. Go right with me real quick here uh, in verse 5. Now Jesus sent them out, and he commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, everybody say go, I want you to preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Whoa. Did Jesus say that? Do you see that happening a lot in churches today? Do you see that happen a lot in America today? No, no. Uh, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, in today's world, we wouldn't say the kingdom of heaven is at hand because most people don't even know what a kingdom is. In other words, what you need to say is, hey, God's at work in your life. Therefore, be healed. Jesus did not commission them out to go out and pray for the sick. I'm not saying praying for the sick is not important, but he didn't commission them to go out and pray for the sick, pray for diseases, and pray for people to get saved. He said pray for them in the harvest in the beginning, 
but now he's saying, I'm sending you out and I'm backing you with my authority. I want you to go and do what you see me do. I want you to do the very works that you see me doing, and I want you to heal the sick, I want you to cast out demons, and I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God is here because I value people's souls more than you do. And so Jesus backs him with authority. So chapter 10, 1 through 15, is all about Jesus equipping his disciples with his authority. His, he didn't give them the mission on how to do it. He didn't say, this is, how, this is the procedure. If you follow step 1, 2, and 3, they will be healed. And if you say this formula, and you say it with this type of a tone, then they will get saved. He does not say that. He says, I just want you to do what I have been doing because you've been following me. So that's chapter 1 through 15. Now, for the rest of the chapter, cha or verses 16 through 31, he's saying, now, as you're going to go out for the first time, and you're about ready to take my name public, people are going to turn on you. This was especially true in Jesus' day when the religious establishment was corrupt and already expressed their hatred towards Jesus. He basically says, a lot of people, when you start, nobody's going to harass you for following me. They're going to harass you when you start doing stuff in my name for following me. That's when they're not going to like you anymore. That's when you're going to be one of those Christians. That's when you're, the religious establishment is going to go hard after you when you start doing these crazy things. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, as you go public with your faith, gulp, there's going to be a crazy amount of intimidating fear on the inside of you. I mean crazy fear. Crazy fear. If Jesus told you today to go out and heal the sick, would you do it? If Jesus said today, go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, and we talked about that last week, it's very simple. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you, for all your sin. If you believe in him, he will forgive you of all your sins and give you eternal life. Is that something you would want? See how simple that was? So Jesus says this. The, I'm, I'm telling you, I've done this thousands of times. And every time I send people out, it's the same experience. Why? Because I deal with it all the time. The moment you start doing anything significant in Jesus' name that's going to impact people, you can expect a crazy amount of fear to come on the inside of you, swirling around on the inside of you. They're going to think, I'm dumb. I'm going to, what am I doing? Uh, yeah, I'm not equipped to do this. I can't do this. This is what's happening in the disciples' hearts right now. Yeah, it's good enough for you now to pray for those to come in the kingdom of God. But now that I want you to go out and start doing it, I want you to start inviting your family, your friends. I want you to start making an impact. You're going to feel a lot of fear on the inside. If the disciples had a lot of fear, don't you think we as disciples are going to have even probably more fear? Every say, I'm afraid. And every say, Billy, where are you going with this? <laughs> so you got this fear going up on the inside of them. But Jesus also assures them, at the same time that this fear is going to be inside of you, the Holy Spirit's activity is going to rest upon you. And so you're going to be having this intermingling between the fear of doing something in my name with, oh my God, Holy Spirit's with me in his name. And so this, this crazy intermingling, there's going to be a war inside of you. The war is going to be fear that says, pull back, shrink back, don't do it. And the Holy Spirit's going to be right there with you going, you got this, you can do this. I want you to say this and do it this way. There's a sensitivity to fear, which I agree that all of us are probably used to. But there's also a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's activity in your life to help you overcome that fear. So you're walking very close with God because the moment you step out, Again, that's when the religious establishment's going to go, uh-uh, oh, no, no. It's good enough for you just to stay in your chair at the church. But the moment you start getting out of the church with that Christian message of yours, and you start bringing it into the school system, oh, we got some problems. Uh, you start bringing that into the workplace, we got some problems. You start bringing that into the gym, into a safe atmosphere, oh, we have some problems. And this is what Jesus is saying. I'm sending you out, and it's going to be tough. And so look at with me in verse 17. He says this. 
But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. He's talking about the religious establishment. And they will scourge you in their churches. They will scourge you in their synagogues. Then the religious establishment will be brought before, sorry, will bring you before governors and kings for my sake and testimony, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry. I may say, I am not worried. Do not worry about how or what you should speak. So, he say, so right here he's saying, hey, the moment you open your mouth now and you start mentioning Jesus to culture, you start mentioning Jesus on the streets, you start mentioning Jesus within the workplace, the moment that happens, there's gonna be a little bit of a kickback. I'm just letting you know. I'm giving you the authority, but there's gonna be a little bit of a kickback, and you're gonna be afraid. But I'm telling you, do not worry about what? Do not worry about how or what you should speak. Have you guys ever had like a special appointment once where you had an important phone call and you started rehearsing in your mind how you were going to say something, what you were going to say, and the tone of voice on how you were going to say it? Jesus is saying this, when that time comes and you're going out, don't worry about how you're going to say it. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I just need you to do it in my name. And then he says, it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak for it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you and through you. So you see this. He's saying this. When I send you out, you're going to be scared. I'm scared. But rest assured, the Holy Spirit in you is going to be speaking through you on what to say and how to say it. Then notice this in verse 25. So he's saying, Holy Spirit's with you. You're going to be afraid, but don't worry. And then notice this right here in verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. So now he goes past the religious establishment, and he says, you're going to be hated by all for my name's sake. Why is it that Muhammad can get away with anything? Seriously, why is it Joseph Smith can get away with things? But you mentioned the name of Jesus? No, we only mention that in a cuss word. We only mention Jesus when we take his name in vain. There is something about that name that makes the darkness of this world shriek and tremble with the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, get bold with Jesus. God doesn't want you to be an in-the-closet Christian. He wants you to get out of the Christian closet and be the man and woman of God he's called you to be and to rise up with the authority he's called you to rise up in. He says this. Notice verse 25. Further, he says, the religious establishment will say what you are doing is wrong. They're going to attack you. If they called me the master of the house Beelzebub, which means uh, prince of demons, how much more are they going to call my household? Therefore, do not fear them. So he says, don't fear them again. He says, listen, if the religious establishment said I was possessed by a demon, what do you think is going to happen with the religious establishment when you go out and you share Jesus with people? I remember I was sharing Jesus with people. I had no problem sometimes with unbelievers, but it was this... It was weird religious people from the church saying, Billy, uh, they didn't know my name. They were just, at, I was at the mall preaching the gospel. And some guy came up to me, and here he comes. He pulls out his Bible. And he goes, Are you preaching that they should get baptized? You need to preach that they get baptized because you can preach Jesus all day long, but if they don't get baptized, they're not going to be saved. And I was like, I'm a new Christian. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm like, oh God, am I supposed to preach baptism? And Jesus said, no, I've called you to preach my name. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He rose from the dead. The only thing that's separating you from God is your sin. Jesus bled for that. He died for that. He rose again. If you open up your heart, allow him to come in, he will forgive you of all your sin and give you eternal life. Is that something you would want? So that's my message. And so that's the gospel. So I preach the gospel. But who is it that attacks me? It's the religious folks. It's the religious folks. It's the religious establishment that says it needs to be done this way, that way, this way, that way. And Jesus says, if they said I had a problem, how much more you when I send you in my name? So he says, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. He says, therefore, do not fear. Notice verse 27. 
Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the rooftops. In other words, as you're going out and you are sharing the gospel, a message of hope, a message of freedom, a message of healing, a message of deliverance, as you're preaching this good news that you just got to turn to Jesus. He's the hope of this world. He's the hope of your soul. He's the eternal life. He is the everlasting father. He is prince of peace. He is all of these things which your soul thirsts and hunger for. As you're doing this, just know this, whatever I say to you in the dark, in other words, my spirit's gonna be so heavy upon you. You guys, when I take people out and we go witnessing, I cannot tell you how many times the Holy Spirit says, hey, do this way. Now, when I woke up that morning to go out witnessing, I wasn't thinking any of that. All I was thinking of is, I'm afraid. I'm terrified. I'm scared. But then I start stepping out. Holy Spirit starts activating me. And now Holy Spirit starts whispering stuff to me. And Jesus says, whatever I whisper to you, because you will get a sense of me speaking to you. You will not hear the audible voice of God speak to you. Your spirit, man, will be sensitive to his spirit, and you'll get an intuition. You'll get a prompting. You'll get a, a knowledge. You'll get just some type of a, of a pulling in a certain direction. He says, whatever I share with you, I want you to say it, and I want you to say it with boldness. I want you to lean into what I'm saying. And then Jesus goes into this whole teaching about overcoming the fear of man. Look at with me in verse 28. He says this, and do not fear, okay, so he's still saying, the disciples are freaked out, and he's just calling it. Verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Do not fear those who kill your body but cannot kill the soul. So now he's talking about how to overcome the fear of man. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear, therefore. Everybody say, do not fear. You are way, 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 way more valuable than a bunch of sparrows all put together. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny them before my father who is in heaven. So he's saying this. As you're going out, you're going to get all this fear going on inside of you. Know that the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. But also know this, that you're going to have to overcome the fear of man. And the only way that you're going to overcome the fear of man in your life is to see the value of your own soul. That you are going to stand before God one day. You have to see the value of your soul in light of the eternal perspective that you are going to stand before God and give an account. And I very, I very much doubt it. When you stand before God and give an account for your life, and he says, hey, were you obedient here when talking to that person about me? We get so hung up on just our own obedience to like, am I sinning or am I not sinning? But there's a greater perspective of the kingdom of God that the Lord is wanting to broaden our bandwidth with, with affecting other people with his mission. His mission is to reach people. And so when you stand before God, he says, I'll tell you who you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, can, has the power and the authority to throw someone in hell. Yeah, I'm telling you, fear him. But you need to know this. You need to know the value of your own soul. He doesn't say that to scare the bezippers out of you. He, he says that because he wants to, you to know the value of your soul. That you're way more worth, you're worth way more than the animal kingdom. And he says, I need you to see yourself standing before me for whoever confesses me on the earth before men, I will confess before my Father who's in heaven. But let me tell you, whoever denies me before men because of the fear of man, I will deny them in heaven. And so it's a sobering thought. So Jesus says, if you want to overcome the fear, you got to see the value of your own soul's worth. In other words, he's saying to his disciples, remember this, I love you. I love you more than all the birds. I love you more than all the cattle on the hill. I love you more than all of that. And there's a greater perspective that you're gonna stand before God one day and give an account. And the, when you're given account, you're gonna have that eternal perspective. And if you have the eternal perspective, it will help you overcome the fear in the now. You gotta overcome that eternal, uh, that fear with an eternal perspective. And say, so let's just recap real quick. Jesus says to his disciples, 
if you want to reach the world for me, you really want to make a difference, the moment you open up your mouth about me, you're putting yourself at risk. Guess what? I'm putting myself at risk with this message. This is not the tickle my ear message, is it? Everybody say grace, Billy. Grace. He says, the moment you go public with your faith, you are putting yourself at risk. For the disciples in Jesus' day, the risk of death was extremely high. The disciples were going into a world filled with predators, people who do not know the gospel, who saw the 12 disciples as vulnerable prey, and who were happy to take advantage of them because of their weakness, because of their insecurities, their lack of training, their lack of experience. Yet Jesus says one really important phrase to sum up everything. He says, I'm giving you authority to reach people for my name. I'm giving you authority over sickness. I'm giving you authority over diseases. I'm giving you authority to turn this world upside down. I want you to have the gospel backed up with authority and power. And I know the moment I send you out, I mean the moment I send you out, it's good for me to come up here and say, God's giving you authority. And we say, amen. But then I tell you to go and activate that authority. Oh God, no, I'm scared. He says, the moment I send you out, you are going to be afraid. And the world's going to hate you. And he sums it all up in this one verse. It's the main text. I want to break it down for you in 10 minutes here. Is that okay? Verse 16. Behold, I send you out like sheep among wolves. I send you out like sheep among wolves. In God's eyes, we are like sheep, and he's the good shepherd. In God's eyes, we are all like sheep. When you say yes to Jesus, you become purified. You become innocent in his eyes. God says, in the final days, I will separate the sheep from the goats when it comes to eternity. And so we become his sheep. Jesus becomes our shepherd. How many guys love Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be on want. His staff and his rod, they comfort me. So we become his sheep. Luke 15, Jesus as a good shepherd, what does he do? When the 99 are there, but one of them wanders off, what, how does the shepherd comfort him? How does the shepherd's staff comfort us as sheep? Well, when he starts seeing us, hey, 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 Billy, Billy, you're, you're going a little bit too far. Come on, come back, yeah, come on back. Come back to church. Oh, well, it's okay. I'm going to clean you up. Oh, Lord, your, your shepherd's staff, it comforts me. Your staff, it comforts me. Because you have this way as a good shepherd of pulling me back in because sheep like to wander. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And then in John chapter 10, Jesus goes into this whole story about how the hired man runs away when he sees a wolf coming. Because the hired man's he doesn't love the sheep like the shepherd. So he just runs away. But Jesus says, I gladly lay down my life for my sheep. Why? Because your rod, it comforts me. So when the wolves come to attack me, I'm not going to just get attacked and shredded. Your rod, it comforts me. Why? Because the rod was used to beat wolves that would attack the sheep. And so, so Jesus, in our relationship with him, he says, you're the sheep. I'm the shepherd. A good shepherd protects, a good shepherd guides, a good shepherd loves and nurtures. Jesus says, I want you to rest. I want to lay you down in green pastures. I want you to rest. So when it comes to your relationship with him, I want you to think of him as he is your good shepherd and you are the sheep of his pasture and he loves you. But he says, now that I'm going to send you out, you got to know this. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Wolves. The best way to be among wolves is to take on the mindset of a snake. It's to take on the mindset of a snake and a dove. He says, behold, I send you out as, as sheep among wolves. Therefore, therefore, I want you to be as harmless as doves and wise as serpents. You see, it's easy for us to think of ourselves, hey, you know what? I need to be as harmless as a dove. Doesn't dove sound good? Doesn't a dove sound good in your Christian walk? 
I'm sending you out, and I want you to be as harmless as a dove. When we think of dove, don't you think of Jesus getting baptized in the water, and here comes the dove? It's like the Spirit came upon him, like a dove, right? So the, the Holy Spirit represents that of a dove. Uh, Jesus says, I want you to be as gentle like that as a dove, or harmless as a dove. We think of 1 Peter 3.15. that says, in your hearts... Set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your name would be, would be ashamed of their slander. So we can understand that the dove represents the Holy Spirit. The dove represents gentleness. The dove actually represents purity. In fact, the Greek word there for dove actually means do not be mixed up. Don't allow impurities to be mixed up in your life when you're going out. So that's what the harmlessness of a dove means. But when we get to the term snake, huh, huh. Jesus, you're telling me to be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. I get the dove thing. And I get the sheep. Bah, I get the whole sheep. Bah, bah, you're, I get the wolves. I get the wolves. I'm scared to death about sharing my faith. Can we be honest? I'm, shared, I'm scared to death sharing my faith. I get it. I'm a sheep among wolves. I'm scared. Be as harmless as a dove. I get that. But as wise as a serpent? Serpents. Most Christians don't want anything to do with serpents. In the scripture, let's be honest, the scripture, serpents represent evil. In Genesis chapter 3, right? The form of a, Satan took on the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden, and on his belly... He's going to crawl around. Psalms 91 says, If you abide in the Lord, you shall trample on the cobra, and the serpent you will trample under your feet. Oh, I like that. Luke 10, 19 says, I give you authority to tread on serpents and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So Jesus gives us authority over snakes. In Romans, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. In Revelation chapter 20, Jesus at the end of the age will take that old serpent, the devil, and throw him in the lake of fire to burn forever and ever. So D Jesus is obviously saying serpents are kind of bad. And you need to overcome serpents. And I've given you the authority to overcome serpents. In the end of the age, Satan, that serpent, will be thrown in the lake of fire. And then he talks about in the gospels about the brood of vipers. He, he just starts saying, hey, Pharisees, brood of vipers. How many of you guys know that's pretty offensive? <laughs> He's not complimenting the Pharisees. And then you got John the Baptist saying, you brood of vipers to the Pharisees. So if Jesus is saying, hey, snakes kind of represent evil, and he's calling the Pharisees who are doing Satan's work a brood of vipers, which is snakes, why would Jesus, right here in this text, the only text that says, I want you to be like a serpent. When I send you out, I want you to be like a serpent. I want you to be like a wise serpent. Is Jesus saying, I want you to uh, just disobey this? Or should we actually take heed that Jesus is commanding us to be wise as serpents? What does the serpent actually entail? Um, what's the wisdom there of a serpent? In other words, Jesus is saying this. I don't want you to be a snake like that of a bad reputation. How many of you guys have heard people say, oh, that guy's a snake. Stay away from him. That guy sells snake oil. Stay away from him. He's not, usually when we think of snake, we think of deception. We think of maliciousness. We think of artfully uh, deceiving other people, being a hypocrite and spitting out poisonous lies. But what does it mean to be a wise serpent? It requires developing discernment to be intellect, uh, intellectual and sensible in our application of knowledge, to have sensible conversations with skill and learning how to avoid harm. I'm going to give you, in closing, I'm going to give you six qualities of a serpent's wisdom. Six qualities of a serpent's wisdom. You guys with me? Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right, number one, if you're taking notes. The wisdom of a serpent is wise, we would learn, because a serpent has already been humbled. A serpent has already been humbled. The Bible says that those who lift themselves up will be humbled. Satan tried to lift himself up and got humbled out of his position out of heaven. 
Similarly, the snake has been humbled low. Satan used to use the snake to deceive Adam and Eve, and as a result, most likely lost their legs. Genesis 3.14. He says this, You are cursed more than all the cattle, more than all the beasts. On your belly you shall go and eat the dust all of your life. And so the snake has been humbled onto its belly. And so be wise as that of a serpent. The serpent has already been humbled the actual snake has already been humbled. It does not have legs. As Christians representing the gospel, we need to remain low. When you are presenting Jesus to other people, go low. Everybody say, go low. go low. Don't come across as arrogant. Don't come across as boastful. Don't come across as prideful. Go low. Go low. Go, how low? Like that of a serpent. Go low to the ground. Eat dust if you have to. Number two. Serpents know how to camouflage. Ser serpents know how to camouflage into their surroundings. They adapt to their surroundings. They can acclimate to their environments. Snakes do not stick out like a sore thumb. They know how to blend into the environments. And when we are witnessing, testifying of Jesus, it would be wise if we didn't stand out like a sore thumb. We should not be drawing a lot of attention to ourselves. Standing and screaming at street corners would not be wisdom, would it? We want to camouflage in our environment. We probably don't want to try to win the businessman dressed up as a homeless guy. We probably don't want to win the homeless guy dressed up as a businessman. Jesus says, or the, Paul says this, to the weak I become weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. He says, I want you to camouflage into the environments that you're in. If you're in a business, guess what? When I worked in the business world, I camouflaged in the business world. When I was working at a blue collar job in Costco, I camouflaged there. I would camouflage in the sporting arena. I would camouflage, adapt. Why? Because I want to blend in like that of a snake. Now, the third thing, serpents are quick to shelter themselves from attack. Serpents aren't looking for a fight. Serpents, snakes are quick to get out of the way. When they're threatened, they sliver out of the way. They go under a walk, rock when faced with potential danger. Proverbs says this, a wise person sees danger and hides himself. Snakes are quick to hide themselves out of harm's way. In other ways, when Jesus, when you're out witnessing or out doing things, you need to sense when it's time to go. You need to have a wisdom about you that says, you know what? I'm not having a big impact here. I need to get out of here. Why? Because they're coming after me. And so you got to slip at the way, out of the way, sliver out of the way. Go wherever you are welcome. There's no use in standing in front of deaf and blind people sharing the gospel, expecting groups of angry and stubborn people, detractors, to suddenly change their mind. He says, I want you to sliver out of the way when you feel like, hey, your life's in danger, sliver out of the way. Number, f uh, the fourth thing, serpents are not intimidated by the big. And God doesn't want you to be intimidated by the big. Serpents can look at a rabbit and go, oh, you're twice my size. You're twice my size. But here's the thing. I have the authority to take dominance over you. Because what you don't know is that God has given me super big jaws. And I can size up you as a rabbit, even though you're bigger than me. Guess what? I'm not going to be intimidated by you, big rabbit. Because I might be low, I might be humbled, but guess what? I can dominate this whole environment. I can dominate the whole situation that God puts me in because I have authority to take dominance over the situation. All I need to do is just open up my mouth and take a big, 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 wide open stance. And God is going to have me overcome the situation. In other words, God's saying, don't be intimidated by the big people in your life. I can never share my, the gospel with the business owner. That guy's too influential. That guy's way out of my league. He's, he's smarter than me. He's better than me. He has a higher status in life over me. No, no, you need to size up that situation and know that God has given you a supernatural ability to overcome all obstacles in your life. Even if it seems bigger than you, you have dominance over it. That's the snake's wisdom. Amen? Number five, serpents are patient and calculated. They don't just randomly strike. Pew, pew, pew. No, sometimes they'll take weeks sizing up a situation. Sometimes you're going to have to take weeks sizing up when, knowing a person's patterns, knowing their habits, know their work environment, know what makes them click on, know what makes them click off. Study them. 
Know them. Know the people that you work with. Study. Know their routines. Know when the perfect opportunity presents itself, and then that's when you go in for the kill. That's when you go in and say, hey, I got some hope for you. You might want to hear about it. Know when to size up. Know when to strike. And then finally, snakes know how to digest real slow. When they say yes to the gospel, because it's good news, and there's a lot of people who are going to be saved. I know this message is going a little bit late today. But when there's good news, know when they say yes to the gospel, you are going to have to digest the whole situation slowly. In other words, don't start putting rules on them immediately. They just said yes to Jesus. All right, all right, all right. Now it's time. Stop with all that cussing. Stop with all the lying. Stop with all the gossip. No, 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 no. Take some time to digest what just happened. Digest the whole discipleship process very slowly. How many of you guys are glad that the moment you got saved, God just didn't hit you over the head with a bunch of rules? And said, all right, now I expect you to be perfect. No, 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 you came to Jesus because you weren't perfect. He made you the righteousness of God. And now he's not telling you to like, hey, now I need you to become immediately a miraculous different person floating, floating in the sky, walking on water. No, no, no. You got to digest the discipleship process very slowly. If you want to overcome not feeling like a sheep among wolves, be as wise as a serpent wise as a serpent, but still be harmless as a dove. There's no maliciousness in the heart. You're not going to attack people. You do come in peace, but you're looking for the right opportunity to take dominance over the situation, taking a low, humble stance, even that on your belly, and you're going to go ahead and open up your mouth, and you're going to watch what Jesus does in overcoming the situation for his glory. God wants to use you. God wants to use Thrive Church. We're going to be a soul-saving church. We will be wise as serpents, innocent at doves, and we're going to be backed with the authority and the power of God to make a staple difference in this region. If you agree with it, say amen. Amen. Let's stand.